My name is Dom Wright. I'm a senior investment manager at Henderson Row, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on the coronavirus and how to respond to market crises. 2020 started with the killing of an Iranian general, prompting fears of World War III, and now we really are at war, albeit against an invisible enemy. On December 31st, Chinese health officials informed the WHO about a cluster of 41 patients with a mysterious pneumonia, most of whom were connected to a wet market in Wuhan. On January 11th, China recorded the first death linked to the novel coronavirus. On January 13th, the first case outside China was reported. And on February 14th, Europe had its first fatality, a Chinese tourist in Paris. We've seen whole countries being locked down, panic buying in supermarkets and dramatic infection increases in Italy, Spain and the US of A. As of March 30th, uh, there have been 724,000 confirmed cases in 177 countries, leading sadly to 34,000 deaths. Fear has swept financial markets, crashing the S&P by 21% and the FTSE by over 30% as investors worry that this urgent health emergency will cripple world GDP growth and lead to mass unemployment and bankruptcies. Across the globe, central banks and national governments have made dramatic interventions, slashing interest rates and injecting enormous levels of stimulus to try and shore up their economies. However, we've seen numerous disasters, wars and stock market crashes over the last century, and there are valuable lessons that we can take from past financial crises. And there are plenty of behavioural mistakes that we as investors can try to avoid whilst also looking for some opportunities. With that background, I'm delighted to introduce two of my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Jason Sue and Dr. Phil Will. Hello to both of you. Hi, Dom. This is Jason calling in from New York. Hi, Dom. This is Phil from London. Great to be here. Uh, Jason is a director of Henderson Row and the founder and chief investment officer of Radiant Global Advisors, our parent company. And Phil is head of investment solutions at Radiant. And in February, he began a secondment to Henderson Row, moving to London from sunny California so that he could meet as many of our clients as possible. Uh, sadly, the lockdown has scuppered in person uh, meetings, um, but I'm so pleased that you're both able to join us uh, virtually today. Um, you are obviously both key decision makers in terms of our Henderson Row client portfolios. Um, and I know that our clients will appreciate your time and your words of wisdom. Um, so my investment manager colleagues at Henderson Row have helped me to source a number of questions from our clients. And we've grouped them into three main topics of conversation uh, for today. Uh, what are the macroeconomic consequences of COVID-19? How is this affecting financial markets? And importantly, what should investors do? Um, so to dive right into the macroeconomic consequences, uh, do you think this will lead to a recession or to a depression? So we definitely expect um, that there are going to be economic consequences. Uh, clearly, uh, most of the countries that have been hit by COVID-19 have gone into a full lockdown, and that means that uh, countries are voluntarily putting their economies on hold temporarily. And um, this is going to have a bit of an effect in the first quarter, but uh, certainly forecasters expect that we're going to take the biggest hit in the second quarter. So if you look at estimates of uh, the effect that this is going to have on GDP growth in the U.S., we're looking at uh, quarter over quarter estimates of negative 27 percent GDP growth uh, from some analysts. Um, when you look at an average, it's around uh, 10 percent negative GDP growth for the second quarter. Uh, when you look at full year 2020 real GDP growth, uh, that's gone negative. Um, and this is not just in the U.S. In the U.K., uh, quarter over quarter, um, we expect negative GDP growth for the full year in the U.K. We're looking at about negative 1% growth in real GDP. And worldwide, where we expect to see higher growth, uh, we're seeing another big hit um, to economic activity. And so uh, we think that certainly... A global recession uh, looks to be in the cards based on the current trajectory. Um, whether this becomes a depression uh, really depends on how policymakers address this. And uh, right now, we're looking at a public health crisis that has had a big effect 
on economic activity and uh, you know, potentially could have an effect on um, the credit markets as well. So I, so I think uh, the question is, does this spill over and become more than just a temporary hit to economic growth? Does this become a full-blown credit crisis and lead to something more severe where there's actual damage to the system that's done um, beyond this temporary pause to economic activity while we wait uh, for um, public health officials to address the virus. It's really sort of an exogenous shock to the market. Um, unlike the global financial crisis, which was an issue with the financial system, this is really something that's come from left field. It's caused an economic disruption. It's caused a hit to financial markets. Um, but we're hoping that it can be addressed and then we can pick up where we left off in terms of uh, economic activity. Uh, and let me take a crack at this question from uh from a more qualitative direction. Uh, when we think about the impact of COVID-19, it really will come in waves. Uh, first and foremost is we have just a overall decline and a very dramatic and sharp decline in uh, consumption. Uh, and that is because we just can't go out. We can't go to restaurants. We can't go to, uh, you know, movie theaters. Uh, we can't even go to a, a party. So there's going to be a dramatic con reduction in consumption that will hit not just you know uh, corporate earnings. Uh, it'll it'll hit all aspect of uh, of our sort of economic data, uh, and then from there you'll have uh, the second wave, which is uh, because corporate earnings will see a dramatic decline in response to a decline in consumption. Uh, you know share price is already forecasting. Uh, many, many quarters of poor numbers, and also uh, there's some risk that this public health crisis doesn't get uh, sort of uh, put under control and, you know, goes from a uh, pandemic to something that is more akin to the Spanish flu, where, where you know, many millions of people uh, might die. Uh, and so the stock market uh, has expressed pessimism around sort of two dimensions and the, the near 30 plus percent decline uh, reflects that. So that's the second wave. Uh, what does that mean? It means there's now a significant decline to our wealth, uh, a negative wealth shock coming from the fact that we just became a lot more uh, poor uh, because our portfolio ha has declined. And that's going to reduce our willingness to consume. Then there's the third channel, which is a income shock, a negative income shock. Uh, you know, Phil's already mentioned uh, unemployment uh, is likely to skyrocket. We're already seeing the latest U.S. number, uh, 3.2 million uh, new unemployment claim. Uh, if you trace that back to the global financial crisis, which was the previous high watermark, it was only 65, uh, 650,000. So we're talking about a 5x uh, increase in unemployment claim. Uh, so a lot of people are losing their jobs, losing their income. So that negative income shock is going to be another hit in our willingness and confidence to consume. So basically, you got sort of three waves or sort of negative shock, right? The initial wave is a public health shock. So you don't go and consume spread over to the corporate sector. So you have a decline stock market uh, that creates a negative wealth shock. And then, you know, more sp spill over into uh, you know, the labor market, loss of jobs cause people to be afraid of, to consume. Even if you're not losing your job, you probably are so concerned about losing your job that even if you're gainfully employed, you're not consuming. So these three waves are likely to create just a dramatic reduction in consumption, which then creates, of course, a negative spiral in, you know, you know corporate earnings as a result of people now really um, not spending money as a result of the wealth and income shock. Uh, which, of course, becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, uh, and it's going to take a lot of government activities to undo that downward spiral. So I think the, the risk of, uh, you know, full-blown depression is high. Yeah. I mean, touching on the kind of government reaction there, I mean, um, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said not to look at the U.S. jobless figures, look at the stimulus. Um, so essentially, I guess he's saying we're expecting the unemployment numbers to be completely over the top awful um, and that's why we've taken such aggressive action um, in in this sort of rescue um, package um, 
what do you think about the kind of policy response from governments that we've seen so far? Is that going to address those three sort of three waves that you mentioned? Yeah, so the the policy response um, has been really just to throw money at this problem. And so uh, we're definitely seeing um, big stimulus packages. So the U.S. announces uh, $2 trillion in stimulus. Um, We've seen similar packages uh, proposed by governments around the world, um, China, big stimulus, um, and and clearly that's going to have uh, a beneficial effect in terms of um, supporting all the people that have lost their jobs. You know, not just in terms of economic support, but there's some psychological support because, as Jason said, um, these are the consumers that we need to uh, drive any sort of rebound that we expect when people are able to get out and start spending again, um, and. You know the, the the stimulus might be um, effective. There's also a question of how this impacts financial markets, and central banks are doing their part, um, cutting rates to zero. Uh, you already had low rates, negative rates around the world, so there's also um, lots of quantitative easing going on. Uh, the U.S. Um, announced unlimited quantitative easing, so they're just going to make unlimited purchases of bonds and other financial assets. Um, to to pump liquidity into the market. Um, These are the sorts of things that are being done. I think it's important to recognize, uh, as we've discussed, this is uh, really at its heart a public health crisis. And so um, stimulus can only do so much. I think there's also a question of how policymakers respond in terms of implementing economic lockdown, social distancing, and all these things that might in the short run have a very disruptive impact, um, but longer term they might prevent this from getting so serious that it does that type of irreparable damage to the economy that we talked about uh, that would make a recovery much more difficult. Phil's absolutely right there. Uh, You know, what we're faced with is a public health crisis. And uh, in terms of the standard government tools, be it monetary easing, you know, cutting interest rates, uh, committing to uh, you know buying of uh, uh, you know bonds and and securities from the public market in support of prices, uh, or uh, fiscal policy, you know outright spending money, uh, you know sending people uh, money to spend, uh, reducing taxes, uh, more government-led investments, expenditures, so on and so forth. Um, you know these are the standard tools. Uh, they're almost uh, too generic, meaning that they're good for all situations, but they're not targeted. To solve the crisis on hand, uh, I think you first of all have to recognize that until you deal with the public health crisis, uh, nothing else is going to work, right? So the analogy here is, you know, if you've been, you know, shot uh, and you have a gun wound uh, and you go to see a doctor and the doctor says, ah, you know, I think it'd be good if you exercise more, uh, you know, uh, eat more healthy, uh, drink more water and, and don't smoke. We, we know that's really, really good advice, and that will lead to your long-term health. But in the short run, you know, probably cleaning a gun wound and sewing back up and stop the bleeding would be the most helpful. So I think until uh, we, we are able to stop the spread of disease, uh, have credible uh, uh, you know, uh, visibility on a forthcoming vaccine, uh, I think everything else is sort of secondary and i think politicians emphasis and focus on leading with monetary policy because that's easy but it doesn't even require congressional approval uh the president could simply force the fed uh, to do something like when the market sees that that we're confusing uh the core of the crisis i think the market can get more disappointed or less enthusiastic about uh, the monetary or the fiscal policy uh so i think that's quite important that that we get you know uh, the ordering of the policy tools correct. Okay, first of all, deal with the the uh, public health crisis. I think that that's that's the most important task on hand. So um, President Trump has said numerous times recently that he doesn't want the treatment to be worse than the disease. Uh, and if we completely tank the economy, then more people will die if we enter a, a deep depression. Um, so he had said that he wanted the economy back up and running by Easter. Um, but appears to have rode back on that um, now uh, a little bit. Um, how valid is that concern, do you think, um, that the treatment could be worse um, in the long run? Well, I think, again, this is a, a public health issue. And so um, the question is, do we want to take a little bit more pain 
early on um, to prevent uh, the number of infections and the number of deaths to, from, from spiraling out of control to the point that rather than being a temporary hold on economic growth, um, this does enough damage to the system that it's difficult or impossible for us to get ourselves out of it without uh, radical changes. And so I think, um, you know, while it seems attractive to sort of rush things and try to get back to work as soon as possible, um, and people are probably sick of being cooped up in the house and they, they want to get on with their lives, uh, there's always the risk that if we exit the lockdown too soon, uh, that um, this uh, sort of goes into a, a completely different phase in terms of um, the public health issues. And then that's clearly going to cause lots of economic damage um, and uh, it, it's it, it's a situation that none of us really want to think about. Um, so, so I think uh, it, the, the question is more pain now and hopefully uh, smoother and shorter experience with COVID-19 or um, do we let things run their course and then uh, all bets are off in terms of the economy? Yeah. You know, the, the disease here is uh, something that uh, if not taken seriously uh, could kill 10 12 percent of those who are infected right so 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 um, if you talk about worldwide infection uh, which swamp the medical support system uh, then mortality rate goes from sub 0.5 percent to what you're seeing in um, Italy uh, in excess of 10 percent uh, well you know then you, you you really have to look at that and say no amount of economic slowdown will be considered too costly to avoid uh, such a, a, a outcome in, in you know, uh, uh, elimination of, of human life when, when we don't take the uh, public health problem seriously. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's not as sensible, like given the magnitude of the numbers, and these numbers are now quite uh, scientific, they're backed by, by data gathered from across so many countries and so many states and provinces. Uh, that you simply cannot ignore uh, those data uh, and you simply cannot say that the, the cost of preventing that outcome uh, from an economic perspective could be considered too high. And you can look at countries, you know, we, we've, we've seen data from countries that have taken this very seriously. And so certainly China, um, where this originated, they took very drastic measures, um, locking down hundreds of millions of people um, for months on end, uh, tracking people's movements, um, tracking down uh, who victims of the virus had contact with, and and really pulling out all the stops in terms of what they could do to combat the virus. Um, and now, uh, when you look at China's economic activity, um, you can see by many measures, uh, there's been quite a significant rebound in terms of economic growth in China. And so uh, by many measures, China's back up to 60 or 80 or 90 percent of uh, the sort of activity that we saw before the virus hit. So I think, um, you know, looking at countries that took this seriously and got over the hump uh, and came out the other side without major damage to their health system or a uh, major cost of human life, you know, tens of thousands of people uh, dead as opposed to hundreds of thousands or millions. Um, those are the sorts of outcomes that we should target. And I think there's also a, uh, a flaw straw man that politicians or some politicians are putting in front of us. It's not a trade-off question. Like everything is actually in this case uh, ubiquitously uh, pointing in the direction that you have to temporarily lock down economic activities to safeguard future economic activities, right? It's not like, oh, the, the more you lock down today, the worse it gets in the future, and it's a matter of, you know, sort of trading off now versus the future. No, no, no. If you want to have a future, you got to lock it down today. So it's, it's not a trade-off question. You know, Phil's already mentioned the country who locked it down the earliest and the fastest will only need to stay in lockdown for the shortest period of time and have the fastest recovery. The country who does not either are slow to a lockdown or have a very poorly executed 
inefficient lockdown will face a much long drawn out lockdown, uh, which will then have a much, much more negative impact to the economy and take a much longer route to recovery. So it's not a trade off question. Like data points to uh, the right thing to do is actually now and quite draconian from the get go. And the point of which is because when people are dead, doesn't matter what policy you have, they can't spend any money. <laughs> so if we kind of take the lockdown seriously in this country and enact it aggressively, we can get that sort of V-shaped sort of rebound where in Q3 we all rush out and spend money on haircuts and drinks in the pub and, and book holidays and, and all those sort of fun things. That's right. Yeah, I, I think going back to the forecast we talked about before, um, whereas pretty much all the forecasters think that Q2 is going to be really ugly right now, um, if you look at all the forecasts based on the current state of affairs in the world, um, based on how uh, the U.S. and other countries are dealing with this right now, the expectation is that um, economic activity is going to resume in uh, the third quarter and that um, by the end of 2020, uh, we'll be pretty much back to where we were when we started this whole thing. Um, that could take uh, a completely unnecessary and really unfavorable turn um, if we see that people don't take this seriously and uh, we start losing the, the fight against this um, really serious public health crisis. And obviously the kind of the reaction between different industries has been sort of very different um, to this crisis so far. Um, which would you say have been hit hardest and have there been any that have weathered the storm or actually um, sort of grown, I guess, in, in, this sort of, um, in this period? Yeah, so we, we talked a little bit about the effect that this is having on people's lives. You know, certainly people aren't um, going out to eat and there, there's some interesting data that are coming out and that's, that's one of the, the differences this time around is that um, there are so many big data sources and alternative data that allow us to visualize how this, uh, how this situation is affecting the global economy. Um, we've seen restaurant traffic, which is now tracked um, by all sorts of apps uh, used by diners. Restaurant traffic um, was falling off uh, starting at the beginning of March, and now we know in a number of countries, restaurants, pubs are completely closed, so restaurant traffic is basically at zero. Um, massive declines in box office returns. People aren't going to the movies. And so certainly there are industries like restaurants, uh, movie theaters that have seen a dramatic hit um, to uh, their, their growth. Airlines, um, who knows what's going to happen to airlines at the end of this. You know, they're looking for bailouts now so that they can uh, continue operating. Um, and, and so some industries have been hit really hard. We see other industries actually looking pretty good. So uh, food retail, um, plenty of people ordering grocery deliveries. Uh, we, we've seen a run on toilet paper. And so clearly some people are benefiting, um, in particular, some of the online retailers. If you look at companies like Amazon, uh, they've done quite well through all of this. Um, so there are winners and losers. And I think uh, from a practical perspective, one of the features of an investment strategy that I think has been underscored by this crisis is just the benefit of diversification, having broad exposure so that even though you'll have some of those loser industries in your portfolio, um, you've also got holdings in uh, segments of the economy um, that uh, if they haven't benefited, at least uh, haven't seen quite, uh, quite as great a shock. And let me add to Phil. Uh, what Phil mentioned are, of course, the first wave of, of hits to the different industries. And like Phil says, uh, winners and losers, <clears throat> you know, from from, uh, you know, uh, restaurants, airline being the biggest losers to Amazon and, and food delivery being the biggest winner. But if you track uh, stock market indices, uh, what you see is across the board, doesn't matter what industry or industry, uh, you know, uh, subsectors uh, across the board, uh, share prices. Uh, have been negative, right? Obviously, you know, energy and and uh, tourist related uh, businesses have done the most poor, and technology 
uh, healthcare, uh, they done better, but they're still down 20% versus a broad market of being down 30%. So I think the point to take away there uh, are two. Uh, one is, uh, you know, when you look past just the immediate hit, uh, sure, you know, you, you might say, ah, yeah, you know, technology, uh, uh, healthcare, uh, the hit's got to be the most minimal to, I would say, their revenue uh, over the next quarter and two. But the fact that they're still down 20% tells you that uh, what the market is uh, really uh, factoring in is a greater overall decline after the first wave, right? Not just from the COVID-19 impact, but really from the spillover effect that goes into, uh, you know, reduction in overall economic activity across the board, both corporate sectors uh, and, and personal consumer. So that's going to be, you know, in some ways, the shockwave will be completely different in nature, though it's, you know, started off as a, as a, as a public health crisis, but the secondary shockwave will be completely different in nature and that it'll just be a cross the board reduction in consumption, not just going out to restaurants, but I would say, you know, buying stuff from, from Amazon uh, or, or, you know, uh, corporate sector adopting uh, technology upgrade simply because uh, uh, there's been capital destruction, people for feel poor, uh, there's been income destruction, uh, people are afraid if they have enough to buffer the bare necessity. So corporations aren't going to spend money, people aren't going to spend money uh, until our balance sheet is, is, is repaired, until uh, you know, unemployment drops significantly from the projected levels. So I think it's the second wave that will hit all the industries. And so I, I would just advise investors uh, from you know not over extrapolating the recent performances of the the uh, industry sectors in response to COVID, uh, and and assume that in the second wave of the shock where it's a much more broad based overall economic uh, shock from a reduction in, in in just willingness to consume. So I wouldn't over extrapolate you know, impact on first wave to understand the impact on the second wave. So I guess we've um, we sort of move on to our the kind of macroeconomic analysis um, um, and how uh, COVID nineteen um, affected the world economy to how it's now sort of affecting um, so financial markets. Um, and your point there for just to kind of clarify, I guess, was um, a little bit like the kind of global financial crisis we saw in two thousand eight. That was so especially devastating because the second wave was then the European debt crisis from two thousand nine and twelve when. Portugal and Italy and Ireland and Greece and Spain were all, were all crashing. Um, so y- you feel we could see so second waves to come in, in the coming years, even if we don't have a, a sort of virus resurgence? Yeah, so a- an example, I think, in this case, is uh, just look at, at China, right? You know, China basically locked down the country very aggressively from the early get-go. Uh, so if you look at uh, their consumption, it's uh, basically come right back, right? As, as Phil mentioned, you have uh, sort of immediate reduction in consumption, but uh, after lockdown is over for most of the cities, people went out and it's what we call catch up consuming, right? They, they feel good, they feel healthy, they feel safe. You know, sure, the hit to income was about a, a month plus, but that's, that's, that's uh, you know, not as big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. And they just want to, you know, you know, Go out a lot more, uh, drink a lot more beer, you know, eat a lot more uh, uh, food, and then and and then then be entertained to 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 uh, you know compensate for uh, a month and a half of locking down. Uh, but what they now are forecasting is, you know, they are not immune from the global crisis. You know, what's happening is, uh, as U.S. consumption, European consumption goes down, China is still 17 percent. Uh, uh, export as fraction of total GDP. So they're now going to get hit by the second wave, which is a global reduction in demand that now is independent of the COVID-19 public health issue. And what you're seeing is factories in China, even though they say 80%, 90% back to capacity in terms of production, uh, 90% of their orders or forecasted orders have been canceled. Right. So, so what is hitting China today and their stock market starting to react is the fact that uh, the second wave is is coming. So you know, if you look at Chinese financial market, the first wave down 10%, less than 10% because by and large they reacted to it uh, fast enough. So the public health crisis was was not really a significant factor. So it's really the second wave that's going to hit China. But that same same second wave will hit everyone else. You know, 
uh, both on the supply side and demand side. Jason, do you, do you think that the markets have, an, have to an extent sort of factored in those second wave um, sort of issues that we're going to see um, in the years ahead? Or is the market still being kind of quite complacent about what all the knock on sort of second wave effects are going to be? Yeah. Usually we think markets are very forward looking. Uh, I think evidence suggests that's not always true. And certainly around sort of crisis time. Uh, what we see instead is market tends to uh, be over optimistic you know market always hopes that uh, uh, it'll be a v-shaped recovery uh, so what we've seen historically is uh, when crisis occurs uh, and crisis usually occurs kind of toward the latter end of a irrational optimistic bull market uh, sentiments riding high uh, probably a lot more sort of retail participation at that time. So initially, when the crisis occurs, people want to shake it off. They go, well, you know, this is probably not as bad as we feared. And and that's more of a, you know, behavioral bias because we just wish it so, not because it is so. Uh, so what you'll see is uh, uh, markets underreact to bad news initially, uh, and it'll overreact to any positive news. You know, self confirmation bias. So we'll see, oh, you know, the Fed's going to do something, problem solve, or you know the. Uh, a fiscal policy is is forthcoming, and that's going to create a new round of rally. Uh, and then it really takes a while for bad news to sort of uh, drip in, and you kind of see, well, every quarter the news is a little bit worse, the numbers a little bit worse, uh, until at some point um, the positive optimism that's betting on V-shaped recovery uh, sort of turns into a more realistic perspective to then a pessimistic perspective. Uh, a V-shaped recovery becomes a W-shape with that second leg down. Uh, and I think uh, if you look at historical data, that's what tends to happen. Uh, so I would say around crisis time, uh, market doesn't do a very good job of sort of factoring uh, that second wave. Right. And are we, are we, would you say that that level of fear is being act, you know, reflected in the bond markets with with um, with sort of yields and spreads as they are at the moment? Yeah, generally what you see is the um, the treasury market tends to be the most institutional and I think does a better job of uh, reflecting fear. Uh, and I would say the the credit market uh, sort of follows suit as a close second with the stock market, I think, uh, generally around crisis time, perhaps being uh, the more emotional and uh, reflect a lot more um, you know, biases. Uh, and, and I think right now, perhaps uh, from a probability perspective, underestimate um, you know, what, what, what other bad things can come and, and the spillover effect. Uh, but I know Phil's done a lot of research, got a lot of data, so I'm going to defer to him to, to, to comment further. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I think one of the things we have to recognize is that when markets misreact, it's usually based on, um, at the highest level, you can think of greed and fear as driving irrational investor behavior. Um, and I mentioned before that uh, we're living in a world of abundant data, um, and we're also living in a world of nonstop news and social media. And so when you think about past crises, uh, I, I think they they always capture the public's attention. But now um, information and even misinformation are coming at us faster than ever. And so if you look at, for example, search data, um, people Googling the term coronavirus, uh, that shows up as a massive spike in the number of searches. And if you compare that to searches for the word crisis, circa 2008, 2009, um, those searches barely show up as a blip on the chart. And so, um, you know, the, the, I guess the precursors for irrational behavior are all there in terms of a uh, constant barrage of information that creates panic and fear and drives people um, to misreact, to, to overreact to bad news. And then when there's any sense that, um, there, as Jason said, there's a new stimulus or um, the Fed is going to do more quantitative easing, um, investors see that and uh, they get these sudden bursts of, of optimism and euphoria only to be brought down again. 
uh, by the next spate of bad news about you know the number of infections in in this country or that country. So it, it's um, th- these sorts of uh, market shocks are really not good for investors in terms of um, really generating the, these animal spirits that lead prices away from fundamentals in a in a really disruptive way. And I think right now, what would be the most dangerous for investors is to, uh, I would say, you know, uh, over consume the uh, talking heads on TV. Uh, people who prognosticate on sort of short-term fluctuations, trying to figure out, uh, you know, the market's reaction to a fiscal stimulus package that might be coming or that might disappoint uh, because uh, there's very little evidence that anyone is any good, uh, even during crisis time, in predicting short-term volatility. So if individual investors... Uh, you know, see this as an opportunity to go in and make big bets and profit from volatility. I would say uh, the evidence is against you in, in being able to do that successfully. So what we're not saying, you know, nothing has changed. You should do exactly the same thing as you've done before. What we are saying is don't overreact. And certainly just because there's a crisis, it doesn't mean and then you're now watching a lot more TV about what's going on. Uh, you're Googling a lot more about markets and, and, and the, uh, the pandemic, it doesn't somehow mean you're now very well informed and you can trade profitably and reacting to the situation in the right direction and capturing a benefit. Evidence is that uh, you will probably uh, overreact, uh, overtrade, and actually create even greater harm than if you uh, uh, held steady and, and don't do very much. I mean, the opportunity is definitely there, but I think most people uh, lack the skill to 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 capture uh, the opportunity, and and that skill is certainly not something uh, that can be gotten by by watching a few TV shows. I saw a quite funny um, sort of joke the other day, which was that um, all of my Facebook friends who were experts on Brexit for the last three years have all become uh, well-renowned epidemiologists and um, uh, well well-appreciated um, sort of experts on uh, sort of pandemics like this. Um, but are there are there famous investors who who called the two thousand eight crash um, correctly? Um, who've also called this right? Are there any examples you can think of? Well, I I, I can think of many uh, who did not, <laughs> and I think that's an important point to share with uh, with investors. So if you think of the two names, the two you know most iconic names who got two thousand eight uh, right, uh, you know you, you got to start off with uh, John Paulson. Right, he delivered a 200% return in 2008 uh, when the market delivered a you know nearly minus 50% return. So uh, instantly he, he he attained godlike status. Uh, I think people named him the greatest investor of the century, uh, forgetting uh, uh, Warren Buffett and, and the likes. Uh, you know he raised 140 billion dollars of new money after making the call right, and uh, five years after that, he lost 70% of that money. Uh, so he didn't uh, really stay in relevance uh, long enough to, to even get to make a call on the uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Another name uh, who really established himself was uh, Ray Dalio of Bridgewater, right? It's, you know, it's amazing that, uh, that, that, you know, a hedge fund guy is almost a household name, uh, and so it's just you know, he sort of parlayed that, that success from 2008 uh, into building a massive hedge fund empire and, and sold a lot of books, too. Uh, what's happened is uh, he's actually been bearish about the uh, global economy, really, uh, post-global financial crisis, thinking that uh, you know, too much money printing uh, will, will, will end badly. Uh, and you know, that's, that's uh, caused him to be wrong uh, for much of that that major bull market until he finally couldn't take it anymore in uh, in, in in the last quarter of 2019 he went from uh, being pessimistic and and bearish to massively bullish only to uh, start to hear heading right into uh, the global uh, stock market meltdown as a result of, uh, of covid 19 pandemic uh, and his uh, hedge fund which uh, is supposed to hedge uh, against you know market beta volatility is down 20 plus percent uh, at a time when people expected uh, 
to really pr protect against the, the downside. So a combination of getting most of the last 10 years wrong, delivering flat return in a raging bull market, and then losing 20%. Uh, you know, it's 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 been it's it's been very tough for for another uh, you know pundit and guru of the yesteryear. Uh, so the, again, you know, these these are two examples of people who got it right once, um, but uh, that that insight, that intuition, did not translate. Uh, and I would say, you know, these are not anecdotes. These are by and large true of most star managers who make big macro calls. Yeah, that's that's incredibly incredibly interesting. Um, and if we can't um, learn from sort of storied or famous investors like that. Are there sort of past um, sort of episodes or pandemics um, that we can learn from about the current crisis and um, the kind of market reaction to SARS or, or MERS um, or, or even the global financial crisis? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the lessons looking at the the history of financial market crises um, and and very specifically the history of pandemics is that um, in the long run, and, and we've alluded to this several times, uh, the economy does recover from these things. You know, the, the engine of global growth, which is really um, human ingenuity and the sorts of ideas that drive um, startups that go on to become uh, trillion dollar companies, um, that doesn't go away because of a uh, global outbreak. And if you look at a very long history of equity market returns, um, we've had pandemics that are much worse uh, than COVID-19, um, even in the most dire scenarios. So uh, Spanish flu in 1918 um, killed upward of 30 million people. And when you look at a chart of the price of the S&P 500 over the years, it's really hard to identify these pandemics because uh, they look like almost imperceptible blips in that chart. So um, one of the lessons I think for investors when they see something like this happen and they imagine uh, just liquidating their portfolio and going to cash, um, the big risk there is that uh, when economic growth resumes, and that can happen unexpectedly, uh, they might miss out on the gains um, that have turned uh, $1 invested in the 1800s uh, into hundreds of thousands of dollars today. Yeah, and I think the big risk of uh, trying to be too clever and uh, and time the bottom is that uh, you might, you just might be right that prices will fall some more. Uh, and so, you know, you clear out your portfolio and you're going to feel pretty smart over the next, uh, you know, three to six months uh, if, you know, uh, prices uh, do do um, take another dip downward, but what we usually see when we look at individual investor data is when the market uh, then gradually uh, make its way back and then deliver you know a 5x return over the subsequent 10 years, you would have missed most of that uh, because most people who get out of the market do a really 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 bad job coming back in. Uh, and so I would say, um, you know, part of timing the market is you got to do both legs correctly, right? Uh, you know, getting out ahead of further decline is pretty smart, but then not getting back in and then missing uh, much of uh, then the subsequent bull ride in response to sort of massive quantitative easing. Uh, that could be a far larger mistake. And, and in fact, that is the far larger mistake that most investors who uh, time and even time appropriately uh, in in the aftermath of a crash, uh, that's the mistake they tend to make is they just don't remember to get back into the market. Yeah, I think we've we've covered the the market reaction um, comprehensively, and I think that the education and context you've provided um, is essential uh, before we move on to um, this sort of last section uh, of what investors should do. Um, the last bull market, uh, RIP, um, was commonly called the most unloved in history, as it stubbornly ground upwards uh, in spite of a host of potential roadblocks. Um, so. I guess the, the kind of question is that investors, as you say, um, are faced with that sort of um, uh, issue of, of should I um, sort of make a big decision on my portfolio and kind of go to cash? Um, and, and is that a kind of just a natural kind of behavioral um, sort of instinct that needs to be resisted, uh, essentially? 
uh, the guess the the kind of the behavioral thing to want to do something to to make an action as a way to kind of sort of solve your problem yeah i think one of the issues is that um when something like covid-19 hits uh we go back and look at um previous episodes previous financial crises um you know uh, other outbreaks and how those played out and with uh, hindsight being 2020 it's easy to come up with narratives and create stories about how we could have uh caught the decline before it happened and how we might have timed things perfectly um you know in our imagination uh doing that in practice doing that ex ante is much more difficult and so um timing is just uh this really tantalizing activity given the way that humans think in terms of stories uh and, and i think um it creates this pitfall that we have to resist and so um taking a more disciplined approach uh not falling into this trap of imagining that it's going to be easy to pick the bottom and like jason said uh you wind up missing it and then um forgetting to get back into the market and losing out on all of the gains um as we do recover from this uh that 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 could be quite a tragedy yeah i mean my one of my favorite um sort of quotes i guess on this subject is is warren buffett's fam- favorite um sort of famous uh letter to the new york times in october 2008 when he he basically said, buy American, I, I am. Uh, and he said, bad news is an investor's best friend. It lets you buy a slice of America's future at a markdown price. Um, over the long term, the stock market news will be good. Uh, in the 20th century, the United States endured two world wars and other traumatic and expensive military conflicts. The Depression, uh, a dozen or so recessions and financial panics, um, oil shocks, a flu epidemic, and the resignation of a disgraced president. Yet the Dow rose from 66 to 11,497. Um, so do you think that, um, that, is still, that sentiment is still, still true today, um, in spite of what we're seeing um, in the news and um, you know, what we're living at the moment? Well, you know, for anyone who was participating in the stock market last year, who was not thinking about asking this question about the long-term prospect, of of the you know global equity market, uh, you know those were people who believe in long term growth and uh, and who believe that the long term growth is so attractive that even last year at a very elevated uh, price to earnings multiple they are willing to participate. Uh, I don't think enough has changed. Uh, certainly not uh, uh, COVID nineteen in its current state to cause one to question uh, long term global growth and the impact of the digital economy and its ability to create more productivity gain and the possibility for more innovation. I just don't think the COVID-19 as as much of a uh, a public health crisis, uh, a human tragedy for those who have lost loved ones, uh, as much sort of sort of a negative shock as it has been, I don't think it's it sort of changed those foundational belief. So in which case, Warren Buffett is exactly right, right? Uh, you're looking at an opportunity to buy at a discount. Is this the cheapest price already? Probably not. And again, who knows? Uh, but it's certainly much cheaper than last year. So if you were a holder and buyer last year, to then say, oh, I'm not a holder and a buyer now because my, my long-term forecast has changed completely, and that's that's clearly sort of irrational and just bad math. Uh, I think one analogy that someone has shared with me that, that I find sort of particularly uh, 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 powerful is, uh, you know, if uh, uh, during, uh, during I guess, the, the last round of global financial crisis, uh, you know, when prices were, were falling for a lot of luxury good item, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, women of uh, famous hedge fund managers, uh, you know, went to Paris and bought Chanel bags and Prada bags on discount in bulk. Whereas their husband, <laughs> while the stock market was also offering a 40% discount, was selling stocks, right? And, and as it turns out, I think the uh, hedge fund wives were much more intelligent buyers than the hedge fund husbands. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, um, I guess, 
at Henderson Row, how would we um, rebalance our asset allocation plan in, in response to the big moves that we've seen um, sort of recently uh, in terms of our uh, equity to fixed income um, kind of ratios um, or more on the marginal side sort of individual um, sort of stocks that we'd be selling and buying? Um, what are we going to be doing for clients um, to 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 best limit our downside and to try and be opportunistic as well? Well, in line with what we've said about uh, avoiding market timing um, and recognizing that it's really hard to make those calls, but that um, we believe in the long run, having exposure to market risk, owning equities, um, owning corporate bonds, having some of your portfolio in sovereign bonds, um, that's going to give you the greatest participation uh, in global economic growth. So rather than try to make timing calls, I think another way of looking at a situation like the current um, financial declines uh, is, is to think opportunistically about um, not going to cash right now, but uh, finding ways to take uh, an opportunistic position. So um, finding the stocks, for example, uh, that have been oversold because uh, certainly there are a lot of companies that are going to be adversely affected. There are companies that won't make it through, but there are also companies that went into this with a very strong financial position. Um, there are companies that went into this uh, with a really good footing uh, in terms of weathering the storm. And then when they do come out the other side, uh, a lot of their competitors will cease to exist. Um, they might be in a stronger position than when they started. And so identifying um, those really strong companies that have been oversold and moving out of some stocks that might have held up well through the first wave uh, and into companies that are set up uh, to, to sustain uh, during that second wave, um, that's the sort of trade we can make without losing our exposure to the market, without giving up all of that upside when the recovery comes. Uh, we're just making sure that we're best positioned to take advantage of a potential rebound. And certainly from a long-term asset allocation perspective, uh, we will react to uh, you know, prices uh, as things start to stabilize, you know, things that have become uh, cheaper. And, and by and large, I think uh, when the dust settles, uh, a lot of stocks are going to be much cheaper now than, than last year or even three years ago. Uh, bonds have become a lot more expensive uh, and its forward-looking yield have, will have come down significantly again. Uh, whereas, you know, credit bonds uh, would probably be yielding a much more attractive spread versus government bonds. So clearly, uh, in our asset allocation, that's all taken into account. These uh, sort of long horizon expected returns will certainly drive our asset allocation model. So, and when we say you know hold steady, we don't mean don't change what you've been doing, uh, but it is uh, to you know, change in a logical, rational, and deliberate way and not overreact and give in to the temptation of trying to predict short-term noise. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing that you've differentiated there, I guess. Um, so, Phil, which of our um, sort of factors would you expect to um, perform best in a, in a period like this? We talk to clients about um, the value, growth, um, sentiment, and quality uh, as the four main factors that um we use to build our asset allocation and our individual stock picks, um, which, which would do best uh, in a period like this and, and which should we be targeting um, for for clients going forwards? So in the long run, um, the models that we use to select stocks uh, for fundamental analysis, these are quantitative models. And uh, when we build these models, they're designed to have balanced performance in the long run. So in up and down markets, uh, we're hoping to outperform uh, an equity benchmark with these portfolios. Now, um, different components of the models uh, are more or less effective in different markets. So you mentioned value, growth, quality, sentiment. These are the four main drivers of the model. And within each of those categories, there are a number of underlying trading signals that we use. But if you think about things at that high level, uh, it turns out that uh, two of those drivers work better in declining markets, and two of those drivers work better in markets that are rising. Value and quality, uh, which I touched on a minute ago, um, they tend to perform better in declining markets. In declining markets, that's when you see um, lots of value stocks, uh, cheap stocks, that turn out to be 
um, real opportunities for investors to buy in at a big discount. Um, but in particular, uh, we recognize that stocks that have fallen in value, um, in many cases, they're cheap for a reason. And so it's important to have quality signals. So looking for companies that are in a strong financial position, uh, companies that haven't overinvested, companies with strong cash flows, with a really healthy balance sheet, um, identifying those companies. So we've got cheap companies uh, that have very high score in terms of uh, the quality of their underlying business, those are the sorts of stocks that we want fundamental research to look at uh, to, to completely flesh out the rest of the story that uh, that any sort of quantitative model might miss. Um, growth and sentiment, those are factors that work better when stocks are rising. Um, you know, so certainly uh, right now, uh, you're seeing a lot of volatility in the market, and so chasing trends is not going to be particularly effective, and that's um, one of the things that the sentiment signals do. Uh, right now, companies that had high growth in the past, um, many of those companies are quite exposed when there's a massive shock to the economy. Um, and so one of the things that we can do right now in terms of our quantitative modeling is focus on the factors like value and quality that we know are going to do better um, during a bear market. Uh, and, and that can drive uh, the stock selection and lead us into some of these great opportunities that I mentioned before. So if you're a, um, a kind of income-focused investor, clearly you're um, not going to get uh, much sort of income from your bonds at the moment, the way that bond prices have been completely squashed. Um, do you see sort of stocks out there with um, sort of attractive dividend yields, or is that... Um, is you know can you um are there too many value traps out there that that's a, a sort of sensible place for you to be hunting yeah I, mean, I think value traps you know that's the key term uh when you look at past episodes where prices have fallen dramatically uh one of the things that happens is price falls before it's reflected in fundamentals so we're still looking at um the same announced dividends but price has fallen and so um the the forecast yield on stocks goes way up. And so you'll see lots of stocks that look like they have a very attractive dividend yield. And it turns out if you look at the data, if you sorted on dividend yield, so pick out the stocks that have the highest yield, those turn out to be going forward the stocks um, that have the biggest shortfall in terms of realized dividend yield. And so uh, it's really difficult to look at dividend yield in isolation. Uh, and think of that as a way of uh, supplementing the income that we used to get from bonds before uh, quantitative easing and these rate cuts um, drove prices way up and yields down. Um, so, so I think uh, getting back to the models that we're using, uh, looking for stocks that are cheap and might have a high dividend yield that also have strong fundamentals, that second piece is really important. Hmm. And what would you say are the big lessons for our investors um, and our, our clients um, now, um, sort of coming out of coming out of this crash? Um, how should we be acting? Um, what should we be doing? For me, one of the big lessons, and um, at Reliant, uh, we design strategies with investor behavior in mind. Uh, and so we're constantly looking for the mistakes that investors make, and we're trying to position ourselves. Um, you know, first of all, we don't want to make the same mistakes, but uh, we want to try to build a portfolio that exploits the mispricings that um, those errors in hu human judgment create. Um, when I look at something like COVID-19, um, you really see uh, human behavior, um, this sort of fear and panic selling. You see that. Uh, at an extreme level. And uh, very often when we're hit with something like this, uh, not only does it have a big impact on our portfolios, but it causes a real sense of fear. It creates dramatic uncertainty. And so for me, one of the lessons when I look at this and I look at past crises is um, that there's a lot to be said for uh, staying the course, not making dramatic changes uh, to your investment decision making. So uh, if what I was doing before was rational, it was working, I shouldn't change my process. And of course, um, when something like this happens, the circumstances change. And so there are going to be changes 
uh, to the composition of our portfolios. Um, but one of the lessons for me is um, when I know that I'm prone to having an emotional reaction, uh, those are the times when it's most important uh, to make rational decisions and to keep a level head and not change the way that I invest, even if markets are changing. You know, the two most reliable and I would say the two most useful uh, pieces of advice that we can give investors uh, are one, be diversified and two, uh, do not aggressively market time. These are also the hardest advice to give to people for the following reason. Um, every time there's a crisis, uh, investor can always point to a talking head on TV. Uh, or every time there's a, a, a you know a massive uh, bull market, particularly a bull market that's quite narrow to a particular sector, investor will also point to that and say, hey, you know, uh, why didn't you avoid a crash? Uh, why didn't you buy the stock or the sector that went up, you know, 80% last year? Uh, what they don't realize is uh, every six months or every year, it's a new talking head talking about the you know, famous uh, crash that they just avoided or a, uh, a story stock that uh, they have in their portfolio. Um, so it's never the same guy. It just means you know, whatever insight that got them uh, right the first time uh, was not applicable the second time. But investors don't recognize that. They just sort of remember, well, there's some guy who is really good who seems to like always get it right. Uh, and, and so they're thinking, well, if I just sort of get it right every time, uh, why would I need to be diversified? Right? I always buy the sector that goes up the most. Uh, you know, Obviously, I'm going to aggressively market time because I'm going to buy before it goes up and sell before it goes down. Uh, and so we're kind of trained by by the media, uh, which really doesn't provide financial education, it provides financial entertainment, uh, and the talking heads on there who, who are paraded like, like you know, uh, uh, superstars, uh, no, that's really for entertainment. That's, that's really not investment advice. Uh, but, but investors make the mistake of uh, believing that, and so what they end up doing is uh, they, they end up aggressively market time, uh, oftentimes in a format of you know, sw- switching between uh, investment managers or investment products. And the result of that, you know, long horizon study is uh, you know, the switching, you know, these wanting to get the right manager, wanting to time the market right, uh, results in very, very significantly lower uh, portfolio returns versus just a very naive, simple, diversify buy and hold, right? The, the, the reduction in return versus diversify buy and hold could be as large as 9% in countries that have much more active investors to about 2% uh, for, for you know, markets uh, like, like US where I think investors are a little bit more educated. Uh, and I think, you know, for other developed markets, that's in between the, the, you know, not so sophisticated retail and the slightly more sophisticated retail that is U.S. Uh, investors who are, are active are, are probably seeing a reduction in return of three, four, five percent. Uh, so my advice to investors is, uh, uh, you know, most of what you see on TV is entertainment. Do not do do not take that as serious investment advice. Uh, and, and if you can, um, you know, stick with the simple stuff. Be broadly diversified. Uh, hold for the long run. Don't market time. I mean, you say that those are the easiest advice to give and also the hardest to follow. Um, would you say that your institutional clients, the sort of sovereign wealth funds and, and large government pension funds that you deal with on a day-to-day basis, are they better at um, following that advice and sort of sticking with their strategies and, and um, what's worked for them before? So as it turns out, uh, sovereign wealth funds, big pension funds are all staffed by human beings. And individual human beings are subject to the same biases. Uh, as it turns out, you know, uh, no amount of schooling uh, really completely eliminates that. So what the institutions do is they put in processes. So decisions are never made by one person. And as a result, uh, it's never a knee-jerk reaction due to emotional excitement or emotional stress. Right, the fact that they have, uh, you know, an investment committee, uh, and the investment committee meets only quarterly, uh, and they are required to have investment consultants uh, to do a study before a decision can be made, all of that is meant to slow decisions down enough, because they know fast, immediate decisions 
generally are ones driven by emotions and tend to be very bad ones. If you just slow everything down, force people to talk, force more people to come in and, and give a uh, counter perspective, then you'll lead to a more sensible decision that will serve you in the long run. So in this case, uh, the institutional uh, policy in place uh, is, is what makes institutions much better investors uh, than, than uh, individual investors, right? It's a difference between, you know, sort of slow decision making by, you know, a group of people versus a, you know, gut reaction made by an individual. And I think that's the biggest difference. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, I think that's something that we could all learn a lot from. Um, well, Jason, Phil, thank you so much for your time uh, and for for joining me um, today. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you for all the, the context and education you provided um, to me uh, and to all of our clients. Um, so thank you very much um, for joining us there. Thanks, Dom. And here's wishing uh, everyone uh, to be safe and sound and uh, stay at home with lots of toilet paper and frozen pizza. <laughs> Thanks, Dom. Thanks, Phil. Thank you for joining Henderson Rowe for this informational webinar. And thank you to Dr. Sue and Dr. Will for joining us today. I hope our listeners found the conversation as interesting as I did. Our compliance department has asked me to note that this communication does not constitute a financial promotion as defined by Section 21 of the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000. The information contained in the video represents the opinion of the speakers and does not necessarily reflect Henderson Rowe's views. Nothing in this webinar represents investment, tax, legal or other advice by Henderson Rowe. Our listeners should always remember that investing involves risks and it isn't for everyone. The value of investments can go up as well as down and investors may not get back the amount invested. Investors should also be sure to understand that past performance is not an indicator of future performance. Henderson Rowe is a registered trading name of Henderson Rowe Limited, which is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority under firm reference 401809. Thank you again for joining us today. Until next time, this is Dom Wright wishing you well. <laughs>